Support for What Matters Most, Your Child's First Five Years is provided by the Hersfeld Foundation and the Terry and Vern Hollobeck Family Foundation. Hello. How nice to see all of you. I'm Portia Young, the host of Milwaukee PBS's 1036 program. As a mother of two wonderful, kind, and I think smart young children, I know that what we teach our children and show our children at a very early age will impact them for the rest of their lives. And I know that all of you care and love for your children, and that's why you're with us today, so thank you. You'll be hearing from a panel of experts whose knowledge we hope will be really helpful to all of you. Dr. Depesh Nafsaria, Ms. Toshiba Adams, Ms. Evelise Perez and Ms. Lana Nanaid. And later on, you'll have the chance to ask them your questions. And that's why they're here today, to share their knowledge and their advice. Our first guest is Dr. Depesh Nafsaria. And Dr. Nafsaria is the founder of the Pediatric Early Literacy Project at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he's also the founder of the Wisconsin affiliate of the nationally recognized program, Reach Out and Read. Dr. Nafsaria also has been involved with the Wisconsin chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics campaign to address the health effects of child poverty. He cares deeply about the development of young children, and that's why we are delighted to have him with us this afternoon. Please welcome Dr. Depesh Nafsaria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'd uh, like to thank our hosts and our sponsors for this event. Uh, it's really a delight to be here. And uh, really, to be able to speak as a primary care pediatrician uh, who works with underserved populations about the important role of parenting and about the projects that are out there is uh, really fantastic. So uh, one of my degrees is actually in library science. I'm actually trained as a children's librarian. So I thought we'd start off with a story, because I think even adults deserve story time. And what I want to do is start off by reading to you from The Dot, which is a book by Boston-based author Peter H. Reynolds. Art class was over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Vashti's teacher leaned over the blank paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. Her teacher smiled. Just make a mark and see where it takes you. Vashti grabbed a marker and gave the paper a good, strong jab. There. Her teacher picked up the paper and studied it carefully. Hmm. She pushed the paper toward Vashti and quietly said, now sign it. Vashti thought for a moment, well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. The next week, when Vashti walked into art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was the little dot she had drawn, her dot, all framed in swirly gold. Hmm, I can make a better dot than that. She opened her never-before-used set of watercolors and set to work. Vashti painted and painted a red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot. The blue mixed with the yellow. She discovered she could make a green dot. Vashti kept experimenting lots of little dots in many colors. If I can make little dots, I can make big dots too. Vashti splashed her colors with a bigger brush on bigger paper to make bigger dots. Vashti even made a dot by not painting a dot. At the school art show a few weeks later, Vashti's mini dots made quite a splash. Vashti noticed a little boy gazing up at her. You're a really great artist. I wish I could draw, he said. I bet you can, said Vashti. Me, no, no, not me. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti smiled. She handed the boy a blank sheet of paper. Show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. Vashti stared at the boy's squiggle, and then she said, sign it. So we'll come back to that story a little bit later. There's a reason I chose that, and uh, I think there's some nice things that come out of it. But I want to point out something that was said earlier and that I think the science really supports, that parents 
already have the resources, the knowledge, so on, that they need in order to be good parents and to help build their child's brain. And there's sometimes this idea that the brain just develops on its own, and actually it doesn't. Some things are in our genes, okay, so the, the blueprint is there, but what we need is the right stimulation to be able to take those patterns, those blueprints, and really have it come out as good, useful skills. We don't want children to only be born with survival skills, right, because then that's all they'll know if they're constantly exposed to violence and noise and yelling and those sorts of things. But if they're given loving, nurturing interactions, relationships that are, that are, that are coming from caregivers, then what will happen is they, they will flourish. The brain circuitry will really come out there. And we all have the same genetic potential for this, these rich learning skills. Okay, it's not that certain people have them or don't have them or anything like that. We all have them. The question is whether they actually come out. So there's sort of a three-legged stool that you can think of for developmental and health trajectories that play out over time. So one of the things that we look at are the, the biology, right? We look at this all the time in medicine and the sciences, and those things are important, okay? We need to make sure everything happened right. Um, you know, preterm babies we know are at higher risk because their, their brains were not quite ready to be out and so on. These are important things. But guess what? We focus a lot on this, but there's something else that's just as important, and that is the socioeconomic environment that children are born and brought up in. Believe it or not, a child's zip code matters more than their genetic code when it comes to development. And a few blocks can make a huge difference. And then we realized it's not just that broad socioeconomic environment that guess what? What matters is what's happening immediately around the child. The attachment, the relationship patterns that go on. All of these things, who's with them at home? Who's with them in their childcare center? How are these people interacting with the child? They matter just as much as the other two. And that's really quite critical. So it may sound a little strange when I say to you that the main driver of development in children is relationships. And that sounds a little warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? That's great. But the fact is, it's true. The only thing that drives development is loving, nurturing, reciprocal interactions, reciprocal meaning back and forth, that young children have with those around them. And if you had to pick out what is the key ingredient, what's the magic there that makes a difference? It's that back and forth. So when your child, when your infant points at something and you say, oh, yeah, you're right. There's a red balloon up there. What, you're doing a really profound, important thing, even to that young infant. You are saying your action, your observation, that pointing matters. It matters enough that I'm looking at it and I'm commenting on it. What you're saying is that you can start to trust that when you point at something, that I'm probably gonna look there and I'm probably gonna validate that. And when a baby gets this early on in life, it is incredibly affirming for them. Now, when you don't have high quality nurturing interactions, it does affect the brain. And I wanna show you one image here. These are head CT scans. These are both three-year-old children. The one on the left, the image on the left, is a typically developing child. The one on the right is a child who underwent extreme emotional neglect. And this is really an extreme circumstance. This is a child from one of the um, Eastern European orphanages in the 1980s, where they had too many kids and not enough staff. Those staff were running around trying to keep up with the basic needs. So they were fed, they were bathed, they were clothed, but no one talked to them or barely did. No one interacted. No one responded to them when they commented on the world around them. So without being a radiologist, you can look at those images and say, hey, that head on the right is small, right? It's much smaller than the one on the left. That brain looks kind of shrunken. It doesn't look as richly developed. Now, this is an extreme circumstance, but the environment, again, affects how the brain comes together. I want to show you one slide of, of this three brain structures because I think it's important to realize that there's such a rich science behind this. There's this part of the brain called the amygdala. This is our fear center, right? This is what keeps us alive when there's a bear in front of us. And when kids have this constant barrage of these sorts of things early on in life, 
their amygdala actually get larger. This is work that's been done right at UW-Madison by uh, Professor Seth Pollock to show that there's a difference between kids who have been um, exposed to adverse circumstances early in life versus those who haven't. Now here's the good news. There's two other parts of the brain that counter the effects of the amygdala. One is what we call the prefrontal cortex, okay? This is your reasoning, your thinking, your long-term kind of planning, your ability to delay gratification, right? This is what makes you think months out, years out, and so on. Uh, this is the part of the brain that's not as well wired in teenagers, actually, which is why teenagers are sometimes impulsive and do crazy things. I have two teenagers myself at home, so. You see that there's less density of neurons in those kids who've had that early adverse circumstances. And you see that part of the brain is not as active as well. And then you have a part of the brain called the hippocampus, big role in memory and mood. The hippocampi are much smaller. Okay, so we've shown this on, on, on imaging. So the reason I'm showing you this is to say, it's not just, oh, you know, this is what something someone thinks or some theory, that we actually can show correlates in the brain that explain some of the behaviors we see in kids who are struggling in school, you know, and so on. And as a primary care pediatrician who works at a community health center, this is one of the things that really gives me the most trouble. I see children at ages six, seven, 12, 14, and they're struggling in school. And their behavior is really all over the place. And what I've learned to say is, go back prenatally to when their mom was pregnant with them and ask about everything that happened. And I don't just mean like, you know, their birth weight and all that business. You know, were you ever homeless? Did you ever have enough, did you always have enough food to eat? And so on and so forth. And what I start to realize is that young children often have a huge pileup of these things. And then we see how the things are happening in school. So the question we should ask, that we should ask in our schools, in our childcare centers, in any interactions that we have, shouldn't be what's wrong with you, it should be what happened to you. Because it actually explains a lot. The other thing is adversity plays out in other ways. And I'm gonna show you just two graphs here. This comes from a large, large study done in the 90s. It's been repeated multiple times. This showed the number of adverse events in a child's life. The more adversity there was, the more likely the child was to have developmental delay, right? That they were behind on their speech or their language or whatever that may be. And guess what? It's not just development. It's things like heart disease as adults. 50 years later, we actually see three times the risk of heart disease as an adult. This is like in their 50s and 60s, so well away from their childhood. So these things are playing out in our, our biology in many different ways. Now here's the good news. Here's what makes the difference when it comes to all these sorts of issues that I've just kind of highlighted for you, and you're, you're getting the very brief version of all this. The thing that guards against it, that acts as a buffer against these types of things is nurturing, loving relationships, okay? And it needs to only be at most one, one person. And that's really critical to recognize that even when things aren't going so well, one nurturing, loving adult can actually counter so many of these things because it reminds a child that they're not alone in the world it reminds them that there is someone out there who's in their corner. And that one person can provide so much of that back and forth. Now, now don't get me wrong. I, I would love there to be many people doing this, of course. But at least one person can really make a key difference. We hope it's a parent, but it could also be another relative. It could be an adult, you know, older sister or brother. It could be even a neighbor. It might even be a teacher. You know, again, we hope it's someone close in in their lives, but these sorts of things make such a key difference. Because a few things about that developing brain, so, you know, we used to think that learning began at about age six. This is like over 100 years ago. And the United States did something really amazing. We said everyone, irrespective of their background, should be able to have a, an education, irrespective of their ability to pay, their social class, anything. So we created free public education. Then we realized it doesn't start at six, five. And we imported this thing from Germany that we call kindergarten. 
right? That's why the name is so funny, right? It's, it's, it's German. And we pulled in this innovation called kindergarten. And remember, where was the first kindergarten in the United States? Watertown, Wisconsin, yes. We were one of the innovators. Now, here's the thing. We have not kept pace in the last 100 years because we've realized the science is showing us learning starts at birth. And we have a lot of people doing very good, rich learning out there. A lot of child care centers and head starts and four-year-old kindergartens and so on. But it's kind of a patchwork. And here's the other thing. Really young children are often not necessarily in early childhood settings. So how do we get to them? How do we get to children in the earliest days of life so that they're getting these rich, nurturing, loving interactions? Well. What's one thing that almost every kid out there, like 99.99% does? They go to the doctor's office, right? And you can be the richest person in the country and you take your kid to the doctor. You can be living in a homeless shelter. And while it might be challenging, you generally bring your kid to the doctor. I see, I see patients like that all the time. So maybe we can use that network to try to connect with families and start this message that will then be reinforced later through other early childhood settings, through preschools, and through the school system, and so on. Because we need to recognize things like this. There are 700 new connections between the neurons in the brain per second in infancy and toddlerhood. It's crazy fast. They're, they're, those neurons are wiring up, and we want them to wire in really good ways. And we want to take advantage of that time. Because it is a lot easier to make those good connections in the first 1,000 to 2,000 days of life, so really by, by age five or so, than it is later on. This is why we don't wait to fix speech delay until they're eight, because it's a lot easier to do it at three than it is at eight. And it's a lot easier to do it at 18 months than it is at three, and so on and so forth. Right? And long before we had all these MRI scans and other studies and so on, Frederick Douglass said something fantastic. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So how do we take the world of the regular checkup and say, what can we do here? Because here's something I want to tell you. I think most parents, in the last five years for sure, most parents have heard this message about read to your child, talk to your child, sing to your child. Right? We put it on billboards. We put ads on the bus. We have small ads during TV spots you know, telling us about this. It's not news to most of the parents I work with. So the issue is not an information gap. So then why isn't it happening as much as we'd like? Because what we're seeing is sometimes a skills gap. And here's the thing. I've learned over time that it's, all, it's very easy for me to say to a parent, just talk to your child. That's what they need from you. And guess what? They listen to me. And they go home, and they sit down their six-month-old. And they look at their six-month-old, and they start to say something. Now, if people around you haven't done this, you start wondering, am I doing this right? Am I saying the right words to my child? My child can't talk back yet. They're only six months. This is hard. And you start to get that self-doubt. And hey, as a parent, you know, I am filled with self-doubt all the time. My teenagers now tell me that I'm not doing the right thing. Um, <laughs> but you worry, are you doing it right? And if you yourself didn't um, do all that well in school, you might wonder, am I even the right person to be doing this? But think back to, you know, the, uh, to what, what we said. The parent is really what's key. The parent. Interacting with their child is really what they need. So what that parent needs is skills, right? It's not an information gap. It's a skills gap. Now, how can we do this? We can do it through coaching. We can coach that parent, and we can model things. Now, here's the thing. How many of you have ever done peekaboo to a child? <clears throat> OK, most of the room. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so peekaboo, you might see a young infant and go, ah, peekaboo, without even thinking. Now, guess, did, is that hardwired into our brain? Does peekaboo happen on its own? Actually, it doesn't. Peekaboo is something that we learn by watching others. Other people did it. And of course, when you do peekaboo to a happy infant, what do they do? They smile, so you're reinforced to do it more. 
But if you haven't had that modeled for you, you may not know. Am I doing this right? What am I supposed to do? And so on. So we can model, we can coach, and we can do this in actually relatively small ways. So when I talk to parents, what, what do I tell them? What's the advice that I try to offer? I say, read together daily. Okay, because if you don't know if you're talking to your child well, all those sorts of things, reading gives you that scaffold, right, to sit and look at a book together. And I want to be very clear that you don't have to read every page. In fact, you don't even need to read the words on the page. Toddlers, okay, 18 months olds, how long is their attention span? Half a second, right? <laughs> right, and that's normal. That is a normal thing. So a parent who might think, oh, my child doesn't like reading, because their child is wandering off and when they're just reading all the words, I coach them, I say, uh -uh. let the child hold the book, let them turn the pages. I don't care if they go backwards. I don't care if they pick out random pages. You don't have to read the story. No one's gonna come give you a test on it. Okay? What I want you to do is just let them engage. So maybe they're looking through the book and you can say, where's Max in this picture? Where's Max? Oh, there he is and he's in a boat. What color is that boat? Yes, you're right, it's a red boat. It turns it into this dialogue, this back and forth. And parents get it, it's modeled for them in just a couple of moments, and then they say, ah, okay, I understand what you're saying. And they're much more likely to be successful in doing this back and forth interaction at a young age. And I know it works, and you know how I know it works? I ask them the same questions at 15 months, 18 months, 24 months. How often do you have a chance to share books together? And most of them look at me and say, yes, we do it every day because you told us to. Okay, so it's like, great, that's wonderful. I also recommend a bedside lamp and let your child read for a few minutes, even if it's five minutes at night. It sets up that habit of nighttime reading and kind of helps them kind of settle down. Limit screen time. So ch children under two should not be on screens. Okay, there is no evidence of any benefit on the screen alone to a child zero benefit. I challenge anyone to show that in, in any commercially available product. And that holds true for DVDs, it holds true for apps, things like that. As a nice saying that I enjoy uh, says out there, um, there is no app to replace your lap. Okay. So limit screen time to less than an hour a day um, for those older kids, none for the younger ones. No screens in the bedrooms. Audiobooks are fine for those older kids. Use your libraries. They are one of our great civic resources and have so much to offer. And again, have reading be fun and not a chore. Because we want this to be something that is a nurturing, loving, reciprocal relationship the child looks forward to. So when they get to preschool or kindergarten or whenever it is, and the teacher pulls out a book and says, we're going to read, you have a child who says, yes, a book. And they're excited about this and ready to learn than the child who looks at it and says, oh, what is this? I'm not sure what this is. It's not just enough to focus on the child. It's not enough to focus just on the parent. We can't view parents just as a way to get to children, and we can't view kids as an impediment to their parents doing better. What we need are truly blended approaches that build the parent's skills and well-being as well as the child over time. And that's really what we talk about when we mean the two-generation approach. I want to end with a photograph. Um, I took this myself. This is my wife uh, reading to my son years ago. And I caught them in this moment of being lost in a book together. And this reminds me of two things. Children are made readers in the laps of their parents. So we need to encourage that. We need to nurture that. We need to support that. We need to build those skills. Number two, parents are their child's first and best teachers and they are completely qualified to do so. They might just need a little hand. We all do. I'm speaking for myself as well. Despite doing this work, you know, we, we all just do the best we can with, with our kids. So I'll leave you with those two thoughts there um, about children and all. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Natsaria, thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our other experts. Ivelise Perez is an elementary school teacher with the Milwaukee Public Schools. <laughs> Ms. 
Lana Nanaid is the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Alliance for Infant Mental Health. And finally, Toshiba Adams is an instructor in early childhood education here at MATC. Welcome to you all. Let's go to the first question. In the fight against childhood obesity, it's reached now the preschool level. What are some innovative strategies to try to combat this issue? Well, obesity is a, a rising problem and has been for, for some time, although I will say the, the two to five year old age group is uh, one of the ones that we've actually seen some success with. Um, a lot of it is really about being able to advise parents and again, help them not just have the information about healthy eating, but also skills. You know, preparing healthy food is not necessarily automatic and uh, being able to coach parents and show them how can they do this and do this well so that their family will actually eat the food um, that they're preparing is, uh, is really critical. I think we need to make better uses, use of dietitians. You know, in my own clinic, we actually have a, a dietitian that I can get in the room immediately after I see a family, uh, just after we've had a conversation about um, perhaps rising weight and uh, about the health concerns that might be connected. So while this is fresh in their mind, I can actually have them seen by a dietitian. Uh, there are other examples out there uh, as well. Um, I also just want to add to that, this is not a very innovative strategy, but just informing parents that it's important for their children to not have a lot of sedentary time. And so the children need to get up and be physical, get outdoor playtime to kind of um, combat some of those calories that they're intaking on a regular basis as well. And I liked what you said earlier, Toshiba, about being the role model too. Right. I mean, if you're not eating good things, they're not going to eat them either. It is important for me to role model the best practices that I want my children to exhibit in their lives. So, I can't encourage them to be healthy eaters or to exercise on a regular basis if I'm not also modeling those type of behaviors. So um, I try to make sure that I'm doing it on a regular basis. It doesn't always work, but um, I stick with it and you just can't give up. Get those apples, get those carrots cut up and mm -hmm. have them see you eating them. Exactly. And also create good experiences when you eat, right? So it's not a power struggle. So it's a joyful experience together. We have our first question. Go right ahead. My name is Yvette. And um, I have a goddaughter, she's two years old. She never sits still um, and she stays up late. Mm -hmm. What kind of tips can I get for her? Um, first of all, it's probably developmentally appropriate for your two year old to move around a lot like that. If you're having issues with that child d during bedtime, I would suggest that you develop a bedtime routine, something that that child can expect to happen on a day to day basis. So for example, you may start, if, you're, if bedtime is 8 o'clock, you may start bath time at 7.30. Then you may offer the baby or the young child warm milk to kind of get them a little bit, you know, into the mood of, of being relaxed. And then I would also suggest reading a book to your child in the bed and kind of closing up um, with that type of routine and doing that on a regular basis because then the child will look forward to those opportunities and engaging and interacting with you. And having a routine and an expectation really makes a big difference for them. Um, and the other thing I'll say is, you're not going to cause problems for your child by setting good limits. Sometimes parents worry, right? If I don't give my child what they want or what they need, am I going to harm my relationship with them? Um, am, I, am I being a bad parent by saying no or not you know, allowing them to do something? It's okay, kids actually need good limits set. I see more problems in kids who, who get no limit setting uh, versus those who, who get reasonable amounts of limit setting. And they'll never tell you that they want the limits to be set, but it does provide them with a level of security um, and it provides them with something to look forward to. Like they need a safe environment and it's up to us as parents and their caregivers to make sure that we set those examples and those limits for those children. Yeah, if it were up to my five-year-old, it'd be dessert every day hey, and right. for every meal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Our next question. Let's go to this side. Hi, my name is Barb. Um, I'm wondering, um, I, I do child care, and I'm wondering what kind of um, good experiences I can give to the kids without spending a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm an educator, and um, there isn't, um, you know, a lot of funds, a lot of money that... Um, we could, um, you know, purchase anything. So you have a really good, good question. So it's a matter of, um, um, 
a matter of being creative, a, um, a matter of exposing them to, um, you know, simple things. Play-Doh, you could even create your own Play-Doh. You know, there's um, recipes and materials that you could find even at home to create um, learning experiences and play-based experiences for them. Um, movement, singing, um, and there's a lot of things that you could do throughout the day with young learners that do not include costs, that just, you know, even just letting them socialize and play um, throughout the day and in the childcare. Um, and structured um, activity centers um, throughout the childcare um, don't necessarily need to be fancy, you know. You could, you could have a, um, an area where they're painting or an area where they're using um, different activities throughout the, the day. And singing and dancing is always free. It's, it's a free activity. So you can sing and you can dance with, with the children throughout the day and include them in, in your daily routines without having to purchase a lot of gadgets. Again, through some of Dr. Nasaria's work mm -hmm. and some of the other research, the gadgets don't really matter as much as the relationship and the building of that relationship with the child. So as long as you're there, as long as you're engaged with them, um, that's going to have a, a more lasting impact than a lot of toys. And to be honest, Sometimes you buy a child an expensive gift. And what they tend to play with a lot is the box that the gift came in. So some of the best things you can do are, you know, some big boxes from refrigerators or washing machines that could be recycled into forts and, you know, bright, so there are pillows, there are old boxes, there are cereal boxes that could be made into blocks. So creativity and um, presence is what they really truly need. All right, thank you. All right, our next question. My, na my name is Alia. Um, my question is, my daycare said I shouldn't let my child have a pacifier or a bottle. Is that right? How old is your child? Two years. Two years. Um, well, first of all, if your child care provider told you that your two-year-old should not have a, bat a bottle or pacifier, they should probably provide rationale for providing you with those suggestions. I know that sometimes, you know, when kids start to develop teeth, the pacifier or something in their mouth constantly can force their teeth to kind of not grow in appropriately. Now, we all know that the two-year-old is going to lose those teeth, and they're going to get their adult teeth eventually. But I also think that it could have an impact on language development, because if the child always has something in their mouth, then maybe they're not talking as much as you would like them to do. Um, so that would be my feedback for rationale as to why maybe you want to get rid of that. And then also sometimes at that age, they'll just let the milk or whatever kind of sit into their mouth, not really drinking it, and then it'll cause tooth decay as well. So, um, but typically they'll wean themselves, but that could be some reasons why you might want to work with your child to start to take it away on a slower pace, but not just take it away all, say it's gone and you, you don't have your nookie anymore. But pr again, a routine for maybe how you would want to start to take that away from your child. But we have a pediatrician here, too, so. <laughs> if, I, if I might, I, I think it's also very important that the child feels safe, and it, it appears that it's helping him it's a, it's a hit, right? Uh, regulate and, and feel calm. And so I think, as uh, Toshiba was saying, so if, if that's something that needs to happen, it will probably has to happen gradually, right? So it's not a cold turkey kind of situation, right? Because. Um, the most important thing for language to develop, for everything to develop, is for the child to feel safe and regulated. I, I agree with both these comments. Um, the, the pediatric dentists actually tell us they're not as worried as much as they used to be about tooth, teeth uh, issues and all. But the bottle has the problem of uh, allowing milk sugars and things like that to sit on the teeth. And I see a lot of cavities as a, as a result. But your point, Lona, is fantastic. that. Sometimes kids hold on to things, whether it's a pacifier or a bottle or a book or a blanket or a stuffed bear, mm -hmm. because it makes them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's a security object, right? So is there a way you can replace that object with something else that also helps them feel, feel comfortable as well? Hi, I'm Brandon. Um, I don't have any children, but I am enrolled in the Early Childhood Program at MATC. Um, in my experience in the child care field, I've heard of stories of parents struggling with separation between them and the child, maybe when they're going to work or dropping their kid off at daycare. Um, so my question is, what are some ways that they can, the parents can um, help ease or eliminate separation? First of all, hooray for being a male and being an early childhood field. 
and for being my student. And for being Toshiba's student. <laughs> And second of all, I mean, things happen in parents' life, right? And those things, those events, of course, affect the child's well-being. So if adults can be adults and be pleasant with each other and, and friendly and uh, polite, right, for the sake of the child, that's, that's so important. It's all about relationships. And children learn through relationships. So, so adults need to remember how to interact with each other, how to be good models for the sake of the child, even if there is a, a difficult, difficult situation within the couple. So you're asking for like strategies on how to separate? Or for like separate um, ways to allow the child to be happier with the idea of separation or not be so stressed out about the mm -hmm. idea of separation. Yeah, um, I think you can also, depending on the age of the child, kind of kind of talk them through what's going to happen. Don't just abruptly leave them in a strange environment and expect them to be OK, because they may not be OK anyway with the talking, but at least it kind of reassures them that you're kind of walking them through the process. This is what's going to happen next. And I'm going to leave you, but when you wake up from nap time today, daddy or mommy will be back to, to retrieve you from your daycare center. So it's really important also for child care providers to have schedules um, throughout the day, especially for preschool age children, because that's how they read time. So they know, well, mommy and daddy's going to drop me off, and then I'm going to have breakfast, and then we're going to have toileting time, and then we're going to have free play, and then we're going to go outside, and then we're going to have nap. And when I wake up from nap every day, mom and dad is going to be there. So it's, again, it's really important to establish those routines because that's how children um, feel secure um, in their environment. So kind of talking them through it and making sure that your child care provider has established routines so your child knows when you're going to come back for them every day. I do want to ask one question that came from advance. So this one. If we could have Ivelisse uh, please answer this one, because if we speak a different language at home, but we want our children to learn English, should I read to my child in my home language or in English? Well, research, and I will also recommend you um, to read to your child in your home language. I mean, children will learn English in school. Um, they will learn English in the community. So it's important for uh, family, if they want to keep the native and first and home language, to continue the home language. Um, children are capable to learn one, two, or many, many languages. It's a matter of um, consistency, continuation, and exposure. So they will learn English. It's OK to speak to your child in your your native language. My own children, um, we speak Spanish at home. Um, and they're in bilingual schools, and they learn uh, both languages. So they're, the older kids are, you know, are biliterate right now, so they read and write in Spanish and English. So it it's, it's, takes time and commitment. And um, it's OK to continue speaking your native language at home. OK, thank you. Please say your name and the age of your children, if you have any. Hello, my name is Nemo Abdi, and I'm in our Only Child Education program. And I have two children. The oldest is three, and the youngest is one. And my question for today is, one, what is one thing that you guys wish um, parents should know about child development? That relationships matter. Positive relationships are impetus to um, a child's growth and development, and the, uh, the connections that are, are formulated within their brain. So just to try to be present um, and available for your child, speak with them, read books to them, um, help to enhance their language development. I think that's really key because language development for preschoolers have a lasting impact on their educational um, achievement um, and how well they will fare in, in their K-12 system as well. So it's not just we're doing it for today, but we're doing it for a lifetime because it really matters over, over a lifetime for those children. Yeah, it's, it's truly all about relationships. And one thing that I would emphasize is that um, there is no such thing as a baby. There is a baby in somebody else. And that somebody else has incredible power and incredible influence on everything that baby will experience, right? Like a diaper change could be a marvelous opportunity for connection, right? For a play, for peekaboo. Or it could be a mundane routine that's smelly and wet, right? And it's up to the parent or up to the caregiver to create what it is for the child. And so if parents could realize their incredible power and their incredible potential for the baby, for the whole new right generation, that would be beautiful. Our next question here. I'm Raina, and although I'm not a mother right now, in the future I hope to be, and I am also enrolled in the Early Childhood Education Program. And I was just curious to know 
what are some ways that we can encourage responsibility in children when they are young? That's a tough one. <laughs> Well, in the classroom, um, we, we have helpers, you know, we have helpers to pass out breakfast, we have helpers that help clean the table. So, I mean, just simple tasks that give them responsibilities and uh, daily routines. They, children love to help. I mean, we don't have to give them, you know, the most difficult jobs, but I think including them in the, um, the work that goes on in the home and also in the classroom as future educators, I think it's important to really include the, the children into what goes on in the classroom and make, making them feel part of the classroom community. You know, simple things as, you know, passing out the pencils or, or being the line leader, you know, they, they love all that. I think also recognizing that what's developmentally appropriate for children to do um, and how much they can take in. So if you tell children, here are the five or six things we'd like you to do, and there are two, they're not going to remember anything past the first one. <laughs> and then you get angry, right? I told you to do this and this. Not, not going to happen in a two-year-old. So um, also setting them up for success based on, on what their developmental uh, uh, stage is. Okay. Thank you. Here's a question, and it's a pretty tough one. I can't afford child care. My son has to go with whoever is available when I need to work. Is this hurting him? I think a lot of parents are unable to afford child care, and that's why I've always been a proponent of universal child care, so that it's not a financial burden on the families. But I think it's not going to have a, a, a real negative impact on the child if the person who is the caregiver is still um, utilizing best practices and, again, these relationships and playing with the child and getting on their level, introducing books and language. So anyone can do it. It's not, I mean, we're sitting up here and you all are stating that we're experts, but we, I don't consider myself an expert at anything. I'm learning just like many of you. I read and I research and that's how I find best practices um, to teach to my students and to, um, to inhabit in my home environment as well. So I think it's like Dr. Saria said earlier, it's all doable. It's just making sure that people have access to the resources and have access to the individuals that can help model the appropriate um, behaviors for them. Thank you. Our next question here. Good afternoon. My name is Mainza. Um, I am the mother of a nine-year-old and seven-year-old, so not so much uh, little, little anymore. My question comes in, um, in regards to a greater community impact, I think, you know, many of us who are a little more privileged, we are in professional positions, we're educated, we understand the significance of early childhood development. But for communities who are still truly underserved, what can we do as a bigger community to really get the message into the homes, you know, into our underserved communities that this is truly significant to our children's future? You know, what are some models out there where we really have true community impact? I think this is where um, the concept of zip code comes in again, because unfortunately in our city of Milwaukee and across our country, your zip code matters. And your zip code determines the type of resources that you have access to, which determines the type of quality programs that you have access to for early education and also for K-12. And unfortunately, we don't have enough of those quality um, institutions within our cities. And I'm not stating that we don't have any. I have colleagues here who run great programs for early education and K-12 programs, but they're not able to service enough. And so I think um, we need to really rally together and talk to our um, political um, agencies within the city of Milwaukee because we as a whole need to do better for our society. We can't determine that because you live in the suburbs, you deserve better, or because you live in the inner city, you don't deserve better. That's really a gross reality that we're, we're witnessing right now. So we need to really push forward policies that's going to actually make a change within our society because otherwise that achievement gap that we see it's not going to go away. It's actually going to continue to spread. And, and research is showing that it does continue to spread because children don't have access to good nutritious meals and stuff like that in their neighborhood. They have access to fast food or there's not employment opportunities for their parents so they cannot break this cycle of poverty. So I think it's, it's bigger than just some of the parents and the students and, and us here on this panel. It's, it's a holistic issue. It's a societal issue and people need to come together to make a difference for all families so that all children have opportunities to greatness and, and success in the long term. I don't know if you have other suggestions. You're from NPS. Yeah, um, in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Public Schools also offers Head Starts, but there's also a model out there in Milwaukee. I know several agencies 
um, offer them. They're called early Head Starts, or they work with the, the families um, from when the mothers are expecting until um, they're three or four, um, from birth until they start school. I know Centro Hispano is one of the agencies, and I know there's several other organizations, but like you all have mentioned, it's a big need. We wish there's a need for more programs and more families to access those programs. Sometimes there's a tendency to say, gee, we, we don't know how to do this, right? That we don't know how to do this well and so on. The fact is we actually do know what to do. Mm -hmm. And there's actually great examples from other countries, including the, the United Kingdom, um, which uh, is arguably much closer to us societally than some other countries. But here in the US, we often, we do one pilot program and we don't fund it well and we don't look out far enough and then we throw up our hands and say, oh well, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. We need to be able to substantially invest in multi-pronged programs with meaningful investment. And the, the other part of the question you're asking is one about scale. You know, So uh, I love home visiting programs. Home visiting programs are fantastic. They have great evidence and so on. We don't have enough dollars to be able to get everyone who could use a home visitor, and I would argue that's perhaps probably most of the population, um, to get to get a home visitor into their homes. So what we need is kind of a multi-tiered approach. What is it that everyone gets that's not gonna be heavy hitting, but everyone gets it because they probably need it? And then for the folks who fall through that first net, what's that second net that has smaller holes that's a little pricier? And then what's the smallest net? All of these levels, this is kind of a public health approach, all of these levels are necessary, but none of them on their own are sufficient. Mm -hmm. Our next question. My name's Mark. My uh, uh, youngest child is 22, hardly in preschool at this point. But I have two nieces with children under age one uh, who are looking for guidance, and I have a lot of interest in education. Uh, there's a lot of research now that uh, identifies perseverance, self-control, curiosity, optimism, and conscientiousness as essential traits that children need to have when they get to the formal education system if they're going to have success in that system for years to come and even after they are graduates of the education system. And so my question is, how can parents teach those things, and particularly parents who are in the stressed lives of people living in poverty, to their preschool children? First of all, I appreciate that you're asking about such important things as curiosity, right, conscientiousness. And so as a society, we should really start focusing on teaching children emotional literacy, not just literacy, right? So just like we teach children alphabet and calendar and colors, we should teach children emotion words. Sad, disappointed, frustrated, these words allow them, when they're a little older, preschool age, to also feel regulated because then they can understand that they're experiencing many emotional states and they have labels for those states. So I think it starts with teaching children emotion literacy, right? And exhibiting emotion literacy. So there are such programs as emotion coaching, we talked about coaching a little bit, that teach adults to notice their own states and notice their children's states, and just giving them labels at the beginning, right? Name it to tame it approach. So little things like that. I think this is a great segue to a question that we got beforehand. Um, this is great. My two-year-old does a lot of pushing and hitting, not mine. This is the question. <laughs> Although she's getting there, and I'm like, no, no, uh, when he is with the other children. So I make him say sorry, but it doesn't seem to change anything. What else can I do? You know, ch children at a young age are uh, naturally what we call egocentric, right? They, they think only about themselves. And um, yeah, the, the sorry can seem half-hearted and kind of rote because they have a hard time taking the perspective of others. And uh, I agree, this is a nice connection to the previous question. Um, we, we, a few of my pediatric colleagues and I recognized that there was a lot of uh, things parents were struggling with, uh, with uh, really current events in the last few months, but how do they teach kindness to their children? How do they teach um, a lot of these qualities that you're discussing? And our response actually was to come up with a book list. Um, 
high quality children's books often teach exactly these sorts of things. And do I expect the two year old to get it, you know, uh, about really being sorry? Of course not. But if they're at least hearing the words, they're hearing the themes and all that. And sometimes it's a little bit easier for a child to be able to relate to someone in a book um, or to even reference a character in a book and say, you know, oh, I feel like so and so rather than say, I feel like whatever, uh, and use that as a way to communicate and connect. So this is, again, where high quality children's books actually do, do make a difference. You could say, I, I feel like Max when his mom sent him to, yes. mm -hmm. to bed without dinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. OK, we are almost at the point where we're going to have to uh, wrap things up, but I do want to get to our next question. Hello, my name is Heather, and I am a first-time mom of a now five-month-old. Um, I have a couple questions about baby sign language. One, is there any evidence that it can aid in speech development? And two, what age is it good for me to start practice signing with my baby? I think baby sign language has been very useful, and I've actually recommended it to some patients, uh, to some families where they're their baby may actually be um, speech delayed because one of the things we often see in those kids is frustration. They, they want to express something and they can't. So if we can give them another route to doing that, um, it, it makes a difference. I mean, the, sadly, the only sign I know is more, um, but that's a pretty big one in most uh, toddlers' worlds um, and so on. I don't know that there's evidence that says you should start at this age and it will work by this point. I don't know that anyone's trialed that. I don't know if any of you have no, seen any anything, but um, it, it can't hurt. Um, and uh, they may not pick it up initially at a very young age, but they may eventually get there. Yeah. Thank you. Our final question. I'm a parent to a almost three-year-old and an almost five-year-old, and I'm also an early childhood um, provider. I was a former MPS teacher for 11 years, and I um, had to go back into the early childhood because I found that the children that I was working with had already kind of to this last question, it's not that they, we, they were masking their, you know, capability, and I felt like we really needed to get back to birth through mm -hmm. five in order to help make changes. And um, it seems like there's a real push in higher, in higher education for this relationship-based and um, experiential learning. Um, and we're maybe starting to catch up to our, the people in the Netherlands who have kind of done all of that research and have proven that that's you know, really where it's at. Do you feel that there's hope for the United States that we're gonna move out of that in a systematic way? Or do you think that there's really a long battle ahead of I just think we, we, we have to feel like there's hope. Otherwise, what we're doing every day doesn't matter, right. right? So we have to continue to feel hopeful. We have to continue to collaborate and network with the individuals that we feel can make a difference. Um, and just like I'm a proponent for universal health, health um, universal education, I am not a proponent for these um, standardized tests because I feel like they create barriers for certain types of kids. If you're not that type of child that fits into that mode that can be successful and you know how to test well, then guess what? When you take that standardized test in third grade, you're going to be labeled a certain way. And then when you have to take those standardized tests for ACT and SAT uh, recognition, that's gonna cause a barrier based on what type of college and university you have access to. That's going to determine the type of career and profession you're able to have access to. That's going to determine the type of income and neighborhood you're able to live in. And then that system just recycles once again. So am I hopeful? Yes, I'm hopeful. There are some issues, but I have to remain hopeful to, to be here and to do the work that I do every day. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but be hopeful is what I'm saying. <laughs> like, like, just believe that we can make a change eventually. I think I, I, I also agree with you. And as an educator, um, I think we need to be an advocate. Um, as a, I teach uh, four-year-olds, and a lot of times I have to be the voice in the school, say, hey, this test is not appropriately, it's not developmentally appropriate for my students or for their language needs. Or, um, you know, even they're right for them to play because the focus is, you know, pre-academics. Um, in my classroom, you know, it's, it's a balance of social emotional learning and pre-academics. And if they are not ready emotionally and cognitively, they're not going to be successful in their, um, in their further career. So I think as educators and parents, we need to advocate and be the voice and, and spread the, you know, the best practices. And we know what's right. We just have to push for it harder. 
I'd like to thank everyone for their wonderful questions in the audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> thank you to our panelists for your expertise, your wisdom, and also your hope. Thank you very much. I'd now like to ask Dr. Napsaria to help close out our program. Doctor? So we've shared a lot of different material with you today, a lot of different concepts and ideas, uh, ranging from brain science and imaging all the way out to parent coaching, something that's uh, very much from the evidence-based to what I call the reality-based. Uh, I'd also like to point out, I started out by reading from uh, a book, uh, The Dot. There's a reason I chose that book, and it's because ultimately it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship between a teacher and a child in that case, it's about a story where that parent, where that teacher took that child and really celebrated the capabilities that she had and understood that she was having a bad day and she was frustrated. And there was something else important that happened, which was that that child then took those skills and turned around and mentored another child. And that really is the hope and promise of really so much of this work. There's a researcher who, when asked, what is it with all these, these studies, like when you look at all of them, the research, the, the models, the problems, all that stuff, what's the one thing that comes out that makes the biggest difference? And I, I think the questioner was asking about, is there a technique or a method or something? And he, he stopped, thought for a second, and he said, you know, what every child really needs is someone who is caring, consistent, and is absolutely crazy about them. And they said, really? That's it? They're like, yes. And I leave you with that thought, that if every child has at least one caring, consistent adult who is crazy about them, then really, our society can accomplish amazing things. Thank you. Thank you all. I really hope you've enjoyed hearing from our panelists as much as I did. Let's give them another big thanks for sharing their expertise and their information with us today. Thank you, Dr. Dipesh Nafsaria, Ivelas Perez, Lana Nanaid, and Toshiba Adams. I'm Portia Young, and on behalf of everyone here at Milwaukee Area Technical College and Milwaukee PBS, thank you and goodbye. Support for What Matters Most, Your Child's First Five Years is provided by the Hersfeld Foundation and the Terry and Vern Hollebeck Family Foundation.